thanks for stopping by on the podcast, dude. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, we had Tomo Fujita on uh, about like a couple months back, and it's really fantastic that there is a, a lot of professional uh, guitar mentors and teachers out there who are doing online lessons. So um, we definitely want to pick your brain a bit because there's some similarities, but there's also a lot of differences when it comes to your, your programs. So it's really cool. Yeah. Um, Tomo is fantastic. And, but the best way I've heard that described is it's a bit like, because obviously people, when, whenever I go to like a party or whenever we, you know, used to go out and meet people and <laughs> wherever in public, um, if I mentioned I played guitar or was a guitar teacher, first thing most people would say is, oh, I've always wanted to play guitar, right? You, you do hear, it is one of those instruments. But I guess um, what a lot of people, yeah, when they're first learning, there can be differences in like what the first chord is or the first lesson or what, what, what should be the first thing that you learn. The best way I've heard that described is the difference between like learning beginner judo to learning beginner karate to learning beginner, you know, whatever else, yeah. beginner ninja or something. Mm -hmm. They will all be slightly different. And the best advice, I could, I'm already giving advice and we're like 10 seconds. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. What a I teacher. Too, so. yeah. <laughs> but the best thing to do is just follow any kind of structure, any program, but the same one for a little time. Because if you do look at one and then look at to the other and look at, look at another and compare them, there's guaranteed going to be differences because they're not, they're, they're different schools of thought. They're from different people. Um, and yeah, I heard that really, oops, sorry. I heard that relatively recently, and uh, that was the best way I'd, I'd heard it put. I think it's fascinating how you'll take some of these songs, like, for example, like It Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, and you'll simplify it, and you'll have it have that sound come through with playing a few chords. But then you also say, all right, once you get comfortable with your finger placement and you're moving your hand on the neck, then we can further it to the next part, which is probably playing you know the legitimate song for it too so it's great that you're simplifying something for a beginner to have that natural like turn up oh this is exactly what it sounds like and then when you get comfortable with that kind of technique there's a more a, like advanced part to playing a song and such well thank you um but also i'd say smells like teen spirits a perfect example because it's a simple song but there's also really specific things that, for example, Kurt did that, that are quite yeah. hard to replicate. But all those things make a basic riff or a simple song sound way cooler than they would otherwise. Yeah. And the devil's in the detail with those. But you can also, people follow me because I do tend, if they like the fact that I make things easier or simplify things or communicate it in a certain way. And um, yeah, we can play that song far easier than copying all the nuances that Kurt did, for example. What's even crazier is that he didn't even know he was doing that kind of stuff, but, and that's what makes him kind of a genius is because like a lot of people will say he plays sloppy and he does these things that seem like intricacies, but in actuality, it was kind of like his own deficiencies coming out in his live recordings. But if you like the music, it doesn't matter. Like that, that's what, that's what it, that's what it's there for. But I think, that's, I think that's really impressive by you because obviously uh, over the course of how YouTube and how uh, streaming has gone along, you've obviously been at the forefront of people going into YouTube, typing in, I want to learn guitar, and you're right there at the top of it with everybody else. So I really appreciate the fact that that you do simplify it so much that it makes it accessible for people that might not have any musical background or think they have no obviously place being able to play a guitar. You, you invite them in and you make it a very inclusive community. So bravo to you for that. That's fantastic stuff. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, um, this search engine is like literally guitar lessons. It's you, Marty music. Yeah. And a couple other, like, it looks like a guitar -io. Like a like a candy yeah. or something. So yeah, yeah. Dude, like it, as soon as you type in that search engine, like guitar lessons, guitar lessons for beginners, your face is right there. The so. YouTube God smiled on me, and <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, a lot of that is is based on people's actual watch habits as well. And so 
I, you know, I don't choose that that video is there at the top of YouTube or the top of Google or whatever. So a lot of it is people that have watched that from around the world actually kept watching it when it was recommended and, and they watched maybe the whole thing and that matters matters the most. And then maybe went on to watch other one of my videos and way more than any other, you know, if anybody wants the top tips for YouTube hacks and how to get all the views and how to do the same themselves, you need you need the audience to respond that way. And you're not necessarily in control of that at all. But if they watch your video and then stay on YouTube and hopefully watch a bunch of your other videos or even anyone else's, as long as they just keep watching, YouTube is going to keep recommending that video. And that's the only reason that one is there it is. Um, yeah, it's because of people like yourself so who, who dug it. YouTube just changed their algorithm, so to speak. Uh, has that affected the way that you've created content or how you approach it at all? So I don't know what change you're referring to because there's been so many. Over. Oh, gotcha. So I've been doing this like since 2000, 2009 was when I created the website. 2012 slash 13 is when my videos started getting seen by anyone more than like 10 or 20 people <laughs> on, a, on a video. Um, and since then, there's been a lot of changes. But what, so what's the most recent one? You tell me. So the, for you specifically? Just, for you? What's, the, what's the most recent change that you've heard about? So what I've heard is that the change the the algorithm is specifically designed now to promote catchy taglines and specifically something with the thumbnail is is what I've been reading. That's been the same since forever though. I mean they they can they can prioritize, they can tweak it, but you know, no one clicks on your video without it having a good title and a good good thumbnail. Absolutely. So um, that's, really. that's all that is. For, so you were talking about how you got started back in 2009 and that your videos on YouTube started getting traction back in 2012. Uh, really, why when I found out that you were you were willing to come on today, I was really interested to hear your timeline leading up to becoming who you are today and, and kind of the, the steps that led you there, wh whether or not you had a mentor that got you to this place or just honestly your story. I'd love <clears> to hear it. Yeah, of course. Um, mentors. Well, uh, first things first, even back when I was a teenager, I was aware that being a guitar teacher was a job, was a thing that you could do. Like way before the internet was, was a thing. This is back in the 90s, okay? <laughs> or if it was the internet, it was Windows 95 internet. But I saw the <laughs> ads in the paper and I had lessons with a couple of those guys um but also i just i didn't go too far down that route because i just always thought being a guitar teacher that's that's the most ridiculous easy job in the world anyone can do that like why well, <laughs> that, that can't be a proper job but i was aware it, it did exist um fast forward to graduating in 2008 from university i did a music degree I, you couldn't even it was 2008 you could barely get a job in mcdonald's no, no, never mind in a recording studio or, or whatever job I was after at the time with my loft. I even wanted to be a film composer for a while at university. I'm a, I'm a big fan of like Danny Elfman and, and John Williams oh, and all yeah. those guys. I, oh, I, absolutely. <laughs> I, I love movies, love film. And yeah, those those kind of big movie soundtracks, a little bit quirky as well. I'm well into all that. But, you know, you, you've got to pay rent and you've got to You've, you've got to make a living and, and earn a crust. So, yeah, I, I actually went back to, I started advertising to be a guitar teacher just on someone else's, um, on a, what do they call them? On an agency website that was, again, just run by some guy from his bedroom. Mm -hmm. But it, that did get me some students, and I started that way, you know, charging £10 an hour. At the same time as that, I did... Um, I had experience as a live music tech, so I was doing like lighting and uh, sound tech. Um, I was in a wedding band for a number of years as well, so it was all just just adding lots of little things, adding up to being a living. But they were the main three like pillars. Um, and as I was learning how to, you know, as I was trying to get better at playing guitar so that I could teach it better, 
stumbled upon YouTube, found all these guys teaching on there. A lot of them were already selling DVDs or whatnot in, in 2009. <laughs> um, but yeah, there certainly seemed to be, uh, that seemed like an amazing opportunity, YouTube itself, even back in 2009. Um, so I did start uploading some, like sporadically, but some guitar lesson videos there. And the, the earliest ones I did are still up there. If anybody wants to like go on my channel and, and just do the search, but um, you know, oldest and newest, yeah. they'll see them up there. They'll, they'll see the, uh, the webcam videos, the, the really <laughs> terrible ones. The ones that aren't even the face, it's, you know, just the guitar and the crotch. This is 11 years ago, so literally 2010, when YouTube was really becoming a very prominent tool for anybody to use, whether you were an influencer or a musician and such, so, yeah. I really thought I'd miss, and I've said this before on podcasts as well, but I really thought I'd missed the boat with it. There was already kind of a first wave of people getting views in general. Um, you know, Mike Schwartz was already there and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> but then there was like there was definitely a second wave in like the start of 2013 i think because a lot of people got ipads that christmas the ipad became a thing but that's only 2013 you know what i mean before then it wasn't there and then there was probably another wave when instagram became big in like 2016 there was a bunch of people came through like um paul david's is one who's I'm a huge phenomenal fan videos fan. now and he's a lovely guy yeah. but he came through in that wave of people who made their videos look really good <laughs> as yeah, opposed I, to people like me that just put it in a, a camera in a room and sat on a sofa they made, <laughs> they made they started editing them and making them look like movies or making making a vlog type video look more like a movie the casey neistat thing right he he yeah. he oh, pioneered yeah. oh he's got yeah. it down pat now i because his older videos like his like how it started versus how it's going was a huge transition and the dude is like he's like top dog like i mean he's no, he's no pewdiepie but he's definitely top dog out there in the youtube yeah, yeah. especially for his filmography like it's incredible. i enjoy actually i enjoy thinking about um because <laughs> because i'm I, I do follow like pete mckinnon's one that i follow i haven't seen, seen a couple of videos for a while actually maybe maybe a couple of months but i've, I've deep dived into his, his videos a lot yeah um, Gary V, someone I followed for a while as well. He does okay. he does some great stuff, but also like it can be a bit much at some point. Yeah, it could be over the top sometimes, but nevertheless, yeah. it's good. I'm a, I'm a bit too English to be into too much of all that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, but it's probably the same for anyone because um, it's just it's just constant, right? He just absolutely churns it out. But it's super inspiring to see because it is the upload button is there for everyone. There's no barrier to entry. It's just whether you decide to um, to kind of kind of go for it. And yeah, the, when you say there has there been mentors, like there's never been any anyone who's particularly, you know, I've met or that I've been on the phone to that totally gave me direction or anything in life or career or for YouTube. The mentors have actually all been the people already doing it, but not necessarily in your field. Like literally half of my ideas and, and inspiration for what to do for my guitar channel has come from exercise YouTube videos or yoga YouTube videos. Yeah, I got a that number one video on 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 YouTube when you search for it and my name came up. That's learn guitar in ten days, right? Yep. That wouldn't exist without yoga with Adrian. Oh wow. That's the reason I made that. Thirty That's... day yoga is the reason I made that. Oh, and the reason okay. I made it ten days is because I never made it past day ten on yoga. <laughs> so i literally I thought like, what is the point you know? that's pretty now cool. for anyone else like they they want way more than that and then they might even go to another guitar teacher if they need something more in depth that's on youtube but for my stuff i do treat my guitar lessons like i want my exercise videos i like for example um learning music's a bit like learning a language languages do not stay in my head i just can't remember foreign words new english words are like the same they just don't <laughs> stick and i need stuff said over and over again repeat the basics get me actually saying the basics and then i might rem remember some of it that's the way i teach guitar essentially and that's the way i think it's effective on youtube but also that's what i was having to do with the people when i first started even as a as i mentioned in 2009 teaching face-to-face -face 
the the students were coming from an agency it was total beginner after total beginner after total beginner and i was having to repeat the basics five times for anyone to get it so as soon as i was on camera or i put a camera in front of myself to advertise those private lessons which was all it was for back then um yeah i did i did the same thing i i i Phil, what I did on camera was stuff that was tried and tested with real people, which is likely the only reason it gained traction, at least back in the early days. I think that's something a lot of people need to hear, though, because like obviously YouTube, especially during the past year where people had to really kind of take into consideration what they wanted to do with their lives because they had kind of <clears> almost a, forcibly a blank slate given to them. A lot yeah. of people tra transition into doing things like doing YouTube and doing whether it be guitar or drums doing art like people wanted to find a way where they can make that a more important and more obviously uh i guess uh pillar in their life as you said Absolutely. so I, I think a lot of people get discouraged though because they might look at people like people that have been there since the beginning like let's say marty music i think everybody uses him as kind of like the person that obviously started the whole thing and people look at him and uh, they think that maybe he had somebody in his corner giving him the direction on how to do it and how to be that successful. When in actuality, it's usually just people like you. You look at a yoga video and you think, maybe I can translate this into guitar, which is something I'm good at. And look, it, it takes off and it becomes a huge success. Well, yeah. So I'd already been filming YouTube videos for about five years at that point. Um but there's that was a what you've described there was genuinely happened where i went i was already making videos but i did see the yoga videos and i was literally doing it and i went this would be an amazing way to teach guitar which is very different to 99 percent of videos that people are going to see and it's also it works well with my strengths because it is just coaching people and talking talking to a camera like it's a real person, which it is because you're expecting someone to listen at the other side. Um, but for someone else, you know, the advantage that they could have over me is they could be amazing at editing, but they're not confident talking on camera. Therefore, a lot of their stuff might, they might be better doing voiceovers. They might have an amazing voiceover voice, you know, so they end up <laughs> scripting all their videos and just doing it that way. And they sound amazing and have some amazing visuals which really enabled you know, them to teach, to reach different people and, and to teach in a way that is really effective for them. That's what you've got to do. And that's, that's, where, that's where it's like, you don't really need mentors. What you need to do is, is, is think in, in that way. Um, you know, play to your strengths and the strengths of the platform, but be inspired by stuff that's outside of your wheelhouse or outside of your specific genre that you wanted to do in because then you get you get the gold that's going to really take you to the next level have you seen a change uh with your um clients in a sense when in the beginning of the pandemic happened when everybody was like at a stay at home process with the world like, you know, oh yeah just just more yeah, yeah. It, i mean I, my audience is primarily made up of beginners and and yeah that it was like double or three times as many on all, all these things, basically, yeah. I know that's what Tomo was saying, too, with his guitar wisdom platform. He said yeah, that that, he... that's not specific to me. That's that's just across the board for guitar. Yeah. I think there were three times as many sales of guitars. Yeah, um, Fender had their best year on record. <laughs> yeah, of course. And um, and good on them. And um, uh, far more women and girls picked up guitar than ever before because... It was, you know, they could, for or for out, I can only speculate as to why, but you can imagine why, because the extra time at home, and it's it's a good hobby to do it, but there's probably a lot of women out there that wanted to play guitar for a long time, and it was only when there was this time put aside, and also they could do it in a way that wasn't judged, you know, they didn't have to attend group classes or go to a guitar shop, they just took, took a punt on, buy a guitar online and, and try and learn online. And, and then they ended up doing it. And I think we can all learn from that, you know, going forward. Absolutely. So I guess uh, what's really cool is obviously the other day I saw that you uh, are going to be releasing your signature ukulele, which is super cool. Because you don't just teach guitar, you teach ukulele, and you also teach piano. So, oh, indeed. So that's pretty neat. I, I think a lot of people overlook that because they get so, like, obviously focused on the guitar aspect of it. So how did the whole signature ukulele thing come about? Where can we get these and what, what's the expectation? 
so they're going to be available in about a month's time. Um, but that's been that's been a surprise actually, because we all remember um, the ever given Suez Canal thing, right? With the, yeah. with the boat getting trapped. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought my batch of ukuleles was behind that, <laughs> oh, my gosh. and I didn't even know if it was on a on a boat yet. It, it, you know, everything got delayed like that side of the world because of that. Um, so I thought we might be struggling to get some ukuleles for Christmas, but it ended. It actually ended up we were just in front of ever given. Oh, thank God! <laughs> so we're all right. Um, and yeah, it came about. I I started making some ukulele videos because it's it does have a lot of crossover to guitar. It has to be said, but it's just a fun instrument, and it was well worth. I particularly want. With ukulele, the, the best opportunity for me is to inspire kids to pay, play a string instrument, which is a gateway to guitar, but also just an instrument at all. It's, ukulele is probably the easiest instrument, at least with strings on it, for, for any kid to pick up and probably any person to pick up. And that correlates with like my core values, really. So yeah, I made some uh, ukulele. I did a 10-day course for ukulele, as I did do with guitar, and it did really well. So I've done more ukulele videos. And last year, I released a signature acoustic guitar with some, uh, with the biggest, well, to be honest, with one of the biggest UK brands for like total beginner guitars. Um, they're Brunswick. They're not, they're not, you know, they're, they're not as well known as some other brands that perhaps, you know, Fender obviously do a huge range of guitars. They do <laughs> yeah. every level, so they're huge. Brunswick are a beginner's brand, but therefore, again, it, Rather than having a signature electric guitar that costs like you know three thousand pounds and was specced up to the max and that no one's going to buy, um, I'd far rather have you know basically a, a, a recommendation that I can hang my hat on and go any beginner can get that and be absolutely fine with it, um, and that's what we've got with my acoustic guitar. With the ukulele, it's basically the same thing, but for a ukulele, it's specced up a lot better because we've tried to match what we've done on the acoustic guitar and make, make the ukulele m match it spec wise and, oh, and look wise and, and everything like that. So it's, it's a lot better than you would expect, um, you know, a beginner ukulele to be, for example, and that'll be available on my website next month. Shall I get it out? It's all zipped up at the moment. So Absolutely. It does. It does come with the, with the case as well. Oh, um, the is beautiful on it too. Yeah. But um, yeah, the headstock, I mean, it's a bit, perhaps a bit cheeky for me to get away with this, but it has the Andy guitar like pick on there. So yeah, the, I, it has been commented that, hang on, this is an Andy guitar ukulele. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it is, because Andy guitar is totally a brand. And I'll tell you something, the Andy guitar thing came about because, um, well, I was trying to come up with a name to call my website. And for a while, I was very happy for about a day because I came up with an amazing, what I thought was the best name ever, oh, which gosh. was ACGT, Andy Crowley Guitar Tuition. And it would be with the ACDC lettering. And I just thought, <laughs> I just thought, take the rest of the day off. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's yeah, it. Sure, dude. And then over the next couple of days, it dawned on me that actually most people I was currently teaching were beginner acoustic players. Only That's half of those, half of them were kids that hadn't even heard of ACDC before. <laughs> went, maybe, and, and maybe I'll get into trouble at some point with ACDC saying you can't do that. Yeah. So that. my last name's Crowley, but I'll often, even people in, in the UK, especially in London, call it Crowley. Because Mr. Crowley, like the Ozzy Osbourne song, yeah, yeah. he even says it, right? Mr. Crowley. Yeah. Like so that. that spelling is immediately just with... with it's power. off. And then there's also Crowley. I live... I live in Brighton in the south of the UK, but there's a place called Crawley, which is C-R-A. And oh, like, okay. again, it's, it's just like no one knows how to pronounce my last name, basically. <laughs> so I was like, how can I simplify that? Yeah, like, I can relate totally. <laughs> absolutely. But uh, what I did want people to know was, because there are a lot of people teaching guitar even back in 2009, um, I was like, I want people to know my name because people learn from people. I don't want to be called you know, any number of guitar awesome, you know, website names or business names and stuff. I wanted it to be, I wanted to have my name on it. And the only way I could shorten that 
was just call it Andy Guitar. And it's similar to Justin Guitar and Marty Music and any number of other people, but I was like, at least at least Andy's a thing. And there's also like, there's an amazing guitarist called Andy McKee. Oh. <laughs> all the stuff. He's phenomenal. And I'm like, oh, of course, I've called myself Andy Guitar, haven't I? Even, <laughs> he's just rolling uh, his eyes at you. He's like, this guy? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, and I'm called Guitar, even though he's like a million times better than me. But um, yeah, you know, if you like Andy McKee, you know his surname. And uh, with me, it's a little bit more difficult. So I've just made it simple for people. So yeah, I see Andy Guitar as like a catch-all term for... Um, my website and stuff that I do in this, in the sort of education, music education, like anything I code, I just call it Andy Guitar. So yeah, this is my Andy Guitar concert ukulele. That's beautiful. That's gorgeous. What's the wood that they use for the production of it? It is uh, laminated mahogany Ooh, with, a satin, with a satin finish. So it's got a bit of a shimmer to it, a little bit of oh, a yeah. shine. Yeah. It's not like some of them look like they've got kind of a resin over them this hasn't got that this is like on the wood it's just like a satin shine to it yeah um i'm a big fan of the darker woods to be honest i think i do I, think totally they the look same way yeah nice and, and the bind all the binding and stuff it's the same as the <laughs> literally the same as the big oh, version wow that's so funny that's so cool Junior. that's nice right <laughs> yeah that's, that's awesome, awesome. It's, just, it's a classy look that's what i always like Picture. And it is, it is harking back to like the you know the 1930s yep. kind of Gibson style actually with that binding to be honest. But the really really I, old guitars kind of have that, and I like that tried and tested look. For some reason, I'm always gravitate. Are you so? Are you a gearhead by any chance, or are you just? I am, but to a point. Like I like what I like, and after that, I don't care. I'll tell you what I did. I've studied a lot of music tech in my life. Like a lot of my degree was actually the music production side of things. And, and back then I was like really adamant that you don't need valve amps. Don't, I want to know what it sounds like and I want to guarantee the sound on recording or live. I want it all to sound the same and I want it to sound the same as when I'm hearing myself play because then it sounds the same across the board. Um, and these days I've kind of gone totally away from that and I'm just like, I want a valve amp and I want to turn it to 10 <laughs> and that's, that's it, that's the sound. <laughs> Completely just did a one. All that matters is what guitar you put into that valve amp, and that's the difference between tones yeah. and and how you play and volume control and stuff like that. Um, but with that being said, I am still I like what I like. I like my plexis. I am historically like a Les Paul player and a Les Paul fan. These days, it's more the Dot Semi three three five style for me. And I got a Stratocaster maybe three years ago now, change how I play. Play a lot better now from owning, from doing the things that sound great on a Telecaster, which is um, like that cage system, Hendrixy type thing. Just sings way more on a Telecaster. It's it's amazing the differences between getting your hands on a Tele and a Strat. Because I'm kind of like the same way. I'm more, of a, I'm more of a bass player, but out of necessity, obviously, to get as much work as I can playing. I learned how to play guitar as well, which has been great. But I always gravitated towards like the humbuckers and obviously more darker tones but getting a strat and a telly in my hand i gravitated towards the telly because the amount you can shape the tone but it's once i put a strat guitar depending depending on what pickups you have in it yeah but the sure. telly it's hard to argue that it's the most versatile guitar it's amazing yeah. the strat when you put it in e flat i think is a game changer though <laughs> it's like oh my oh. god it's like just a match made in heaven it's it's just, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Well, they have the strings as well, the Stevie Ray Vaughan thing. Yeah, yeah, music. yeah ab absolutely. So me, me and George were, uh, him and I, we, we do an original band together. and we, we did some cover gigs before the pandemic, and then obviously that kind of halted a lot. But usually George just rolls his eyes at guitar talk for me because he's a drummer himself. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, so you're a drummer. Amazing. So I, um, I think it's really important for all guitar players to learn how to play basic bits. Oh, I think absolutely. It, just, it, it makes you listen to music differently, and I think you should be able to write a bass line to anything. Yeah. Because then, then you know what to leave space for as a guitar player. Mm -hmm. And it just means, like, listen to the music that you're playing over as a guitar player is really important. It's, it's a really interesting... Because <clears throat> I, I think about how the way I learned growing up 
And my stepfather was a working cover musician. Um, he did original work as well, but he was a bass player. And he essentially just left the instrument in the room without pushing it on me. And he would like, he would offer to teach me all the time, but I, I never had any musical background. So eventually I just decided like I wanted to play it, but kind of like how you talk about how you, how you teach your students and obviously bring it to basics first. The way I've always thought about this from how I learned and why I, I was like immediately hooked was he never forced me to do the rudimentary music theory stuff, like the like learning the major scale. Like, yeah, he introduced me to that, but that wasn't the important thing. What he did for me was he showed me how to play music I was listening to or that I wanted to listen to without specifically knowing what was going on or why it was working the way it did. To be able to play to your favorite music, that's an emotional thing that you get. And to be able to do that is one of the best experiences ever. And I try and tell people, especially with easier stuff, because like people don't realize how easy, easy some Beatles songs are. Obviously, they're very early stuff. Like Love Me Do is like a, what, a three chord song. You can learn that as a novice in a couple hours, maybe a couple days. But like you said, it, anybody can do it. It's just, a, it's just a matter of just doing it consistently and build, having the building blocks there. But it's, it's, it has to quickly line up to something that you want to do. It's absolutely right. Yeah. Most people don't, their dream isn't to play the C major scale in front of their family <laughs> or their friends. No. <laughs> it is absolutely to play a song that they like or that they, that they know other people will like. And, but then eventually those, those goals do change and perhaps it's to be able to play something in a guitar shop or have play guitar in front of people that isn't one song or another song it's just you're just you're just playing it kind of like the the um gear demo guys can just play something that makes the most of the gear they're playing that yep. can be a higher level goal but yeah still you're not you, it, it's a mistake to think that knowing all the music theory or even to be able to do something like read music which a lot of guitarists feel bad for not being able to do but you know Angus Young and Jimi Hendrix couldn't and can't read music, you know. So, so why, why does it have to be a goal of yours? It doesn't. It doesn't at all. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, it's usually really disheartening because I try and push people to do it. I've always teetered on the idea of, and this will drive <clears> me to another question in a minute of, of doing some form of lessons at a smaller scale. Obviously, I don't know. I, I think what I'm, I really would like to know from you is, for you and your career, has there ever been a moment? to where you felt you felt very confident with the amount of knowledge that you had and passing it on to others. Did In the beginning, did you feel kind of like, I'm not at this level yet, but there is no level that you have to work towards or where somebody can point and say, oh, you're ready to teach. Is that Was that ever like a, a hurdle for you to get across? That's a really good question. And the way you phrased it was really good as well, because I, I, never, I never felt that I wasn't good enough to teach because I realized that, I mean, frankly, all you have to be is slightly better than the person you're teaching and you'll be able to give them something. But what I realized very quickly was, especially with one-to-one -one lessons, you can have all the lesson plans in the world, but if the person hasn't done the work, you need to change what you, you can't give the same lesson plan to someone who hasn't done the, the homework or, or hasn't done what you thought they had. So straight away, I was like, hang on, the first way I've tried with you is not working. And what I realized was, all right, I need two or three ways to teach really every main topic, like open chords, bar chords, basic strumming and rhythms. The same way is not going to work with everyone. And what I found really quickly was, all right, I need, I, do, I, I need to remember to look for another or think of another way to teach that because... The way I teach that will work, the way I've done that will work sometimes, but not always. And then what you find is, yeah, you're teaching someone that, um, teach someone a technique like string bending or vibrato, um, which I was never actually that good at. My, my vibrato technique is something I had to work loads at because it's, it's, it's not great. And when I came to teaching, I was like, ah, I need to get a lot better at that if I'm going to pass anything on there. So yeah, at various points you realize that you, everyone has weaknesses in your playing. It doesn't mean that you can't teach. I think as soon as anybody can play like anything, like one song, three chords, they should pass that on if, if they can. They, they shouldn't feel like they shouldn't, but they should pass it on with the humility of this is, this is what I know and 
someone else might teach you different but this works as, as in this is a c chord and you can put your fingers here you know someone who's got a beginner with some experience can absolutely teach a beginner with no experience something and they, i'd encourage that i don't want to put anyone off from that it's really useful yeah i, I know george you were doing lessons for a while with drumming and how'd you find it <laughs> Ah, just a local music store down the street. I loved it. <laughs> I connected. I, I had a very well connection with my mentor. Um, and when I wanted to get serious into this industry, um, he taught me more than music. We talked about music business. And that was a very interesting thing learning early on in my years um, concerning the podcast. Um, and I have been very involved with social media, trying to be an influencer. Like going back to what you said earlier, dude, it's especially when you're talking to the camera you are talking to people and it's some it's difficult to find that voice it's difficult to yeah. have that engagement of i'm having a clear like well spoken you know hook or lesson in your sense to bring that out and to grab the attention of the of the viewer or the listener early on so but i thoroughly enjoyed it I, I i you know we still talk every so often i don't take lessons from him anymore but i've learned more than i could have ever imagined um with him and then as well as the music business side of things that's what i was really interested in because he's done it he's he's been through you know the woodworks he was you know a drummer for record playing studios in new york city and almost was in kiss so it's like, he, dude, like, he played it's, with he played with buddy rich right i mean they were boys um, yeah, I don't know if they were crazy together, um, but yeah, they were they were boys. He has some funny stories too. But, um, <laughs> the one thing I was really interested in too is because you know I don't play guitar at all. I guess that kind of like you know you know spoiler alert exposed that out of me. But and I love playing guitar too. Like I think finger picking like the rhythm the rhythmic part of that too is like very fascinating to me. And like I try I, I can do something like that. Like I try to teach myself and whatever. Um, but when you have these these lessons being put out there um for beginners or intermediate um students like what's like the most uh what's the biggest hurdle that you see most of your clients um have a hard time trying to get past when they are picking up this instrument in a sense um obviously I, I'm unsure how to answer that because these days I don't teach one to one particularly. Right. Um, though I do some like long weekends of like, it's called guitar breaks. So where we take like 10 or 20 people and we'll teach them how to play songs together, teach them, give them the intense course of lessons and then do a gig, you know, that kind of thing. We offer, we offer oh, cool. that kind of experience. I like that. Yeah. Um, but you know for something like finger style i guess the the question is that you know deciding on which path to follow and 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 just being able to have that for something like finger style that daily ded dedication is probably the most important thing um a cool thing with that is i had lessons myself with an amazing finger style player and teacher who he was well aware that like i taught as well so he's like look everything that i'm going to recommend for you I can also name you five players who don't play it this way or the way that they play, you know, counter ca contradicts what I'm telling you. Right. With, he said, with my experience, this is the way that I would recommend playing it. But you've also, I do recommend fine tweaking it to work for you because that's what all the best players do. Um, and there's nothing that's going to help more than finding something that works and then sticking to it. And being able st to stick to it because the way that you're practicing is um, is comfortable and is, you know, he, he was the one that recommended to me to like have a chair with good lower back support and that you can alter the height with when it came to finger style. You know, things like that that you wouldn't really think of, but you're like, yeah, if you if you need to do this two hours a day, five days a week, you know, make yeah. sure your chair's right. You know what I mean? Yeah, or if you need him to do it for a gig, you're going to be stood up. We need to practice stood up all the time. Yeah, that I mean that, like that that's an unsung thing. People don't realize that the amount of change it is from sitting down playing in your bedroom and then you play in a band and you have to stand up and play. I remember when I first started playing, I'm like, this is that it's a whole different kind of feel. It's to totally it. different. The muscle memory is totally different, and it's it's it frustrating to me because I I really love to practice stood up, 
but I, I just I, I can't find a good way to film myself playing guitar stood up so I like to sit down the, the set looks better it's it's I can have everything in place I'm not moving all over the place but I play better stood up because I always have but so, because that was always the goal as well when I was like 14 you know just got a new electric guitar I, I oh yeah it in a band. yeah yeah you want to rock naturally yeah <laughs> around the stage like who doesn't? That's the first thing I think of if I want to play guitar. Is I just want to, you know, just start doing, you know, windmills with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know that was a weird one as well because I did, I, I did so I, well. I, I, I was in a cover band, and that was, you know, paying a wage for me to be. Honest. I was putting food on the table for a good, yeah. you know, for a good five years actually. They're called Northern Vinyl. There'll be plenty of videos online if people do search for it. Thanks. Some with another singer, some with me. Um. But I did decide that I didn't need to earn a living at all from playing live. I did I did tick that off the list and was like, let's let's say goodbye to that and just um, work as much as I can Monday to Friday. Um, and you have to sort of decide of it's it's not the when you're saying the thing that mentors can help you with and the questions you should ask yourself if this is you have these creative passions that you want to follow and make that your working life. You have to ask yourself, how, how do you want to earn your money? And and it doesn't have to be gigging and it doesn't have to be social media. You know, when when the world goes a bit more back to normal, you could just gig yeah. and you wouldn't have to. And you will still there will still be you can still do that method, whatever you're happy with. You don't have to you don't have to be on TikTok to earn a living as a musician in 2021. You don't make money on TikTok. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but some people do. Or you could just yeah. do TikTok. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah, George, George became a uh, an influencer back in Very a couple months ago. He yeah. so he's been doing he he found a niche of uh, suggesting music and putting like smaller underground bands on playlists as a way to oh. for for people to discover new music, which is kind of interesting that you brought that up because I wanted to ask you what you're listening to now. And before you answer that question, it's it's kind of interesting how. TikTok kind of like looked like a joke for a while, and now it seems to be that's that's the media where you a lot of people are discovering new sounds. And it's I wonder if you had any experiences of any thoughts based off being on YouTube and what maybe you thought about TikTok. No, I really do, and I never, I certainly never saw it as a joke, even though it can be the butt of a joke. Like well, I'm on TikTok, you know, follow me on TikTok. Like we, it's it yeah. is, you know, we we can all look at it that way, but. As I say, like that's how YouTube was to most people back when I uploaded videos and I was watching it back in 2009. Yeah, it's true. the same. It is a cyclical thing. The way the the thing that I'm most fortunate with is that I I, I knew that it, it was. I did feel like I found a bit of, my, of a calling in life, just teaching guitar and especially teaching the guitar to beginners and intermediates like that is something i was more comfortable doing and was happier doing than than most things and and i was i was i was good at it compared to a lot of people who were even better guitar players and better musicians than me i could get more results from beginners and i was happy with the job and the life and then like so that was already like my dream job regardless of youtube YouTube was an it's an incredibly good way. It's an incredibly effective way to teach a lot of people something, especially beginners. And then after that, it became this whole community that it is now, where you can so many people doing it. You can learn anything at any level. There's something for any. I learn stuff all the time from it. You know, it's amazing. Um, but the, it, there's something there that's tried and true. They're not going to change. You know what notes or the chord shapes are on a guitar. They're not going to come up. There can be a new tuning, but that's not going to be the new standard tuning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not going to come up with a new note or anything like that. Typically, it's going to like this is the thing. Which, if you teach something like um, Photoshop or computer coding, like I studied a bit of computer coding in the 2000s because I thought I, I quite fancied having an online business and learning all that. It's all redundant now. It's all absolutely yeah. redundant. It's just so so. It's all changing. I think it's really. The thing that's really worked for me is simplified stuff, but it's also led to a fair bit of success is just reducing stuff back to you teach guitar, whatever platform you can teach guitar on that's going to have optimum impact, then do that. 
And for the most part, that's been YouTube. But more and more, it's like you can't you can't ignore TikTok because even if you're not making TikTok videos, there's YouTube Shorts now, which is the same thing. There's YouTube yeah. Stories, which is the same thing. Instagram Reels is the same thing. Like you can't ignore it because it's already it's already every it's already on the other platforms that you're claiming you're the you're the go-to guy on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's where it's made easier for me than it is for anyone that perhaps wants to do all of this social media stuff to promote your own music or a business that doesn't easily correspond to you know selling an online course to or selling a signature ukulele or some sort of signature instrument like the what my niche is it lines up super well to what i want to do and my skill set but also it lines up to like there's a pathway for that make videos make courses and you if if they're good you'll do well absolutely and you've got to think of what that is in in your niche and also what 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 your skill set is because for a long time like to to make for example to make a living as uh, or to get better at being a sound tech and a lighting tech for venues like the O2 Academy venues we have in Leeds where Slash played and Thin Lizzy played and I worked those gigs but to make a living in that I also had to do lights for nightclubs where I was leaving, I was arriving at work at 7 p.m. and then finishing work at 7 a.m. Yep. And then would get up for 2 p.m. and then teach someone beginner guitar at 3 p.m. Like that was my life <laughs> in my 20s. Yeah. That was my life. Yeah, it's very busy. It's, and it's a weird thing, which is why I have now thought, and we've even had it when we've been scheduling this, I'm like, I want it to be as close to nine to five hours as possible because I've done it the other way around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't, and I don't, en- I don't envy anyone that does shift work as as odd hours as that. And I don't, you, you know, the the evenings and weekends, which the creative industries ob- um, usually are, was something that I was quite happy to go. You know what? Yeah. I'll leave that. I'll leave that for other people, and I'll fight for the nine to five, so that when I'm off, you know, my girlfriend's off and my friends are off. Yeah, it's way more conducive to like a normal lifestyle, but like, you know, it's kind of it's kind of odd because. A lot of people like want a gig. Like everybody likes gigging. If you're a musician, that obviously at some point to get in front of people and play, like there's no other feeling like it. But people will realize, especially like getting cover gigs, is it's really cool in the beginning when you're doing it, and then a couple months go by and it's every Saturday and Friday night. You can't do certain things. You're the first one in, last one to leave. The novelty of it wears off a little bit. Nevertheless, like it's a it's a blessing to be able to do those kind of things for sure. But you know, I remember like, it well. I remember it well. I remember yeah. really. I couldn't understand why more people that I knew were struggling musicians or or played guitar really well but had a nine to five job couldn't believe more people weren't in a cover band or some way of getting I paid know. for playing guitar on a Friday and Saturday night. And then after about four years of playing a very similar set, yeah. <laughs> of playing a lot of, you know, gradually, you know, I think it's the progress. I think it's like the gradually bigger venues, the gradually bigger crowds. And then it kind of, you hit, I hit a ceiling with them. We were playing the same venues and playing to the same crowds. And it was another bride and yeah. another bride. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? You it's the, the same, same songs too. You're not really playing yeah. what you passionately want to play. And then the thrill of it becomes like, the crowd reaction to those same songs you know are we getting the maximum reaction from pe- if the reactions from people keep getting bigger it's a hell of a thrill so it doesn't yeah, it doesn't even matter what songs you play and if if the if people go mental for it when you're playing something it is amazing you can see why djs do it you know the whole oh, push yeah. the button thing and then jumping up and down because like yep. <laughs> people think that just people don't realize it often crowds react as much to that than they do easily to do as you know belting guitar so probably more so just play the big bit of the song and jump up and down and the crowd goes more mental than they will for a technical drum fill or anything you know <laughs> you see why you can see why people do it and, and but it, and it is a thrill but i think yeah it's the same with people learning an instrument though people respond to progress if if everything's going in one direction and, and building every every few days or few weeks that that's enough of a drug to keep people doing something and um yeah a huge thing that i try and work even with beginners is just like musical outlets you know record something play along to original recordings hear yourself back 
record yourself and keep that as a record of where you're at now and compare that in a month's time and listen back to yourself and be like, wow, I, I can hear a big difference there. That's immensely motivating. And you don't have to wait until you're really good or good, whatever that is, you know, to, to do those sorts of things. Yeah, that that's that's so true. It that's a I mean that's actually a good piece of advice I wish more people would take in is to record your progress even from the very beginning because you don't know how big the strides that you're making are until you actually hear it. Even if mm -hmm. it's something that you did two or three days prior to that. Maybe you couldn't use your pinky finger to do some some movement or some walk through the guitar and then all of a sudden you can do it. Like that that stuff's pretty pretty motivating. You're absolutely right about that. Um George, I don't know if you have anything else. I I think we'll probably get you out of here. It's been a good amount of time, but I definitely want to know before you before you head out. Uh, what it, so? What have you been listening to? What's uh, what has been on your playlist? What's been on your Spotify? There's been one band more than most, and it is absolutely Monoskin. Eurovision 2021 winners <laughs> that have actually an amazing album. They're a phenomenal live band. They're a rock band. And they're all over the global Spotify top 10. And it's well-deserved and it's amazing to see. And I absolutely love them. They're amazing. So that's what's been on repeat for you? It really has, yeah. <laughs> want to be a slave, I want to be a man. We got some tunes, man. We got some absolute tunes. I have an addiction to that. You just repeat the song or album, whatever, multiple times. And then you're like, all right, I need something new now. <laughs> I, have bad, <laughs> I have a bad habit of doing that. I'm like, it's not that I don't like the song anymore. It's just like, all right, I've already embedded this into my head for the past 30 minutes straight. Let's listen to something else. You know, often I have to, I have to learn something often to kind of get it out of my head. Oh, okay. It's like, oh, yeah. unless I figured out how to play it, I, I yeah. won't be, it'll just stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, insufferably, because then it's just you just thinking about the entire time until you actually do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a, it's a good thing. What about you guys? I mean, I mean, George, you're the one, this is your forte right here. You're always looking for new stuff. Oh, man. Um, well, I what I usually try to do is uh, get as many uh, bands that I'm thoroughly interested in and have them on the podcast, too. So there's like a couple bands that I've been really digging into. Um, there's an underground band called What Makes Sense. They're going to be releasing a single soon, which I think is revolutionary for the pop punk uh, uh, scene. Uh, it, they're super small, but like the song just has that power hit that's like, okay, I can see where they're going with this. Um, another band this day secret of like a very ambient post hardcore uh, band and uh, Rory is a phenomenal vocalist and uh, he they're 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 super underrated in my opinion but I think they're gonna be starting making some some waves soon hopefully um, that that that's like my pure niche uh, and then oh what's the one band I just put on the other day that I got addicted to um, I mean I was listening to Royal Blood yesterday and then I oh yeah uh, a good uh, album. Oh, dude, that's incredible! Like Zach introduced me to them with um, "Figure It Out." That's that song. We we they're based in my uh, city. They're based in Brighton. Yeah, they did. So I saw them when they opened up for the Foo Fighters on the tour where Dave Grohl broke his leg when he had the guitar thrown a few years back. I saw him that gig as well. We, yeah. we, uh, I saw the Throne tour. They they came they came around here, and I I was a fan of them, but I didn't realize that it was just them two together. And I knew it was a bass player going through like the AV selector switch and then yeah. obviously running the two rigs, which is so cool. But they had such a command of the audience as an opening act with two guys. Yeah, I was blown away. But yeah, we, we actually did that as a cover band. We did that at a bar one night. So oh, that <laughs> was, was the like, song I needed to play, dude. The drums are just yeah. incredible in that song. And have you ever listened to Dirty Loops by any chance? They're like a like a progressive pop band. Dirty Lips, no. It sounds sounds like a street, but... There's a song called Hit Me that I'm a huge fan. It's like, I don't know, dude. They're just all over the place. And the guy just has a soprano that just fucking like, blows me away. So <laughs> they're, they're pretty good. How many streams do they have on Spotify? 115,000 monthly listeners. That's actually not a lot. That's super underrated. But I think they're incredible, for sure. Hang on. Dirty Loops or Dirty Lips? Yes, Dirty Loops. Yeah, dirty, dirty Loops. Loops. Got you. Um, yeah. I'm gonna listen to them after this. But um, for before you get off too, do you have uh, for your future career and your success that you've already brought to light with your business and teaching guitar? 
Do you have any other milestones that you are planning to reach in the near future? I mean, there's one coming up that's two million YouTube subscribers, but it's kind of right there. Yeah, <laughs> it would be silly. It would be silly to say that that was a milestone that was, um, you know, in my mind at any point other than when I hit about one point five million. <laughs> it's like so, it's so just with, with that. You don't. You, don't you certainly don't want to get into this game thinking, oh yeah. As soon as I, as soon as I get two million subscribers, I'll know I've really got my stuff together. Because yeah, it's kind of um, it's bad, and it and it is a bit. I, I I don't I don't wish to downplay it at all, but it's it genuinely isn't the thing that that motivates it. It's far more again progress is the motivating thing, and the uh, the daily views. You know what they're doing is is something I pay far more attention to rather than than the big milestones there but you do need big game stuff the blue sky thinking to make you make you aim for stuff and um yeah i mean i'm actually i'm i'm overdue a meeting with with my close team my, my web developers um who are both good friends of mine uh one of them who we took on like two years ago so just before the pandemic and he was in a corporate job before that and really unhappy and he's pretty much full time for me now and and is really enjoying it i believe and you know he's still he's, we're still good friends now even even though i'm sort of his boss and stuff but yeah we we do great things and that that's what makes me most proud of all of this i think as well as just you know the messages i receive from people i remember as soon as i started selling like um dvds and books the, one of the first ones i posted were to hallelujah in hawaii wow i didn't even know where hallelujah yeah. was and it was on his account like that's kind of, that's kind of mad and it's it's that that's far better than any milestone it just as soon as you realize the impact you've had to a single person who's bothered to get in touch bothered to ask something or or you know buy a ukulele you know that the stories behind those people and and the people behind the stories are the thing that that um are far more important than any kind of numbers milestone i think that's fantastic yeah so we appreciate we appreciate you coming on dude uh taking the time uh andyguitar.co.uk is the website for the lessons um but brother be safe out there hopefully this pandemic ends soon um, <laughs> yeah and like you know maybe we'll uh see you in the near future zach and i want to do this in person and we have already got the uk in our eyes for the near future, absolutely so. do you know what, actually there's someone visiting in a couple of weeks uh elizabeth shiroff who's the charismatic voice on youtube she's a singing teacher and uh, she makes singing videos and she's in america but she's coming to visit in like a month or something and uh, you know doing the quarantine and stuff doing it all legit but yeah she's, she's coming over here it's it, so it is all happening and I, I i don't think i mentioned on the pod as well um it was before we were recording but yeah i, I went to a gig last week and it's it's all happening again so it's good to see the world's thank going god. a bit more thank how god. did that make you feel by like, just playing that gig that, that first gig back and um, amazing yeah i mean i was only a t it was a frank turner gig so i only went as a fan but um it was it was great and you know i'm double vax now so i was more than happy to uh yeah, to go and show support and and get involved not you know i'm not going crazy but you've got to do some stuff right it's um you know, live music's been harder hit than most things, so I'm happy to support it. It's the best. Absolutely.